We've built a lot of those parts of the stack ourselves because we feel that it can offer us actually competitive differentiation. And when you look at a lot of the head-to-head competitive metrics that we measure to make sure that's true, we believe it's panning out. So for us, it's really about identifying the problem and working backwards. Like, is it a big enough problem to solve with technology? And then kind of develop a thesis from there and ultimately solve it with a, a technology product or working with a vendor externally. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of The Dime. I'm Brian Fields. With me, as always, is Kellen Finney. And this week, we got a very special guest, Zach Marburger, Chief Information Officer at Cresco Labs. Zach, thanks for taking the time. How are you doing today? I'm doing all right, guys. How are we doing? Excited to have you here. Kellen, how are you doing? I'm doing really well. Really excited to talk to Zach. Really excited to kind of dive into back end of what makes these companies kind of tick and like what separates them from each other. How are you doing, Brian? Yeah, I'm stoked. I think we're going to get really nerdy today into the type of topics that I think Kellen and I both really enjoy and type of the topics that I think other people are going to find a little more interesting than they most realize. Because I think at, at, at the end of the day, right, we've got buckets of big MSOs, but there's differences between them all. And Cresso's got some real unique characteristics that we're going to highlight today. But Zach, before we kind of dive into all the fun stuff, I know you've traveled to Denver before. I'm not even going to let Kellen get there. But if you had to have a current location, East or West Coast, where are you going to be? I guess Chicago is east of the Mississippi, so we're going east. There she is, Kelly. I guess that's my <laughs> geographical rationale. I love it. I love it. So cool. Can you give a little background about yourself and kind of how you found your way to Cresco Labs? Yeah, so I guess um, through a roundabout way, I started off in Colorado like a bunch of folks did in cannabis in the early days and have been working in cannabis since 2013-14. And uh, we had a software company at the time and Charlie and uh, the Cresco folks were starting up about that same time in Illinois. And we met each other in Colorado around that time vis-a-vis a consulting relationship. And one thing led to another and I was uh, arguably the first or second guy, depending on who you ask, uh, in the door. And I've kind of been here ever since uh, doing mostly tech stuff and, and having a role of CIO. But I think I've also been the janitor. I've been the the sales guy. I've been the everything uh, since then. So um, yeah, I've been here for quite the ride. What is your background? Sure. So largely, I'm just an entrepreneur. I mean, I have a technical leaning. I'm a hack job programmer. I have a, a network of very strong, technically inclined professional friends who build really material stuff that I've always worked with and. Uh, I've been a child that grew up on the internet, right? Like that first generation that grew up on the internet. So tech has always been a piece of the heart, if you will. And um, previously I built two small tech companies, Rose Angel and Venture Funding for them both, and really have always just been a hacker, you know, in in the the traditional sense. I love it. So we're going to get into some of the nuances of it. So take us through Cresco and some of the specialties that your skill set brings to the table that people might not be so familiar with. Yeah, I think maybe even zooming out to the industry too. And like that determines, right, the sandbox we play in. Cannabis, as I'm sure you guys have talked about on your previous episodes, like we have to trace everything, right? There's this implication of seed to sale traceability, and that exists in slightly different ways from market to market. It adds a really like burdensome opportunity for operators to have to enter data into systems add tags to plants, do all these types of things that ultimately allow you to trace the thing that you're producing and selling. And so at the root of your technology infrastructure, that's really where your heartbeat lies, right? That's really where you're interfacing with. And a lot of these systems you've heard of, or or maybe spoke to folks over there, right? Metric, Biotrack, um, uh, New Leaf Data Systems, and there's some others. Um, Sometimes they're a necessary evil, Sometimes they're an amazing partner. It depends on the circumstances within the state. But ultimately, all the technology systems that a cannabis business has, including Cresco, have to go back to that thing in some form or fashion, be it our cultivation environment and making sure our plants are uh, talking to the state and they know how many plants we have, our manufacturing environment or our retail. So I think it's really important to kind of have that basis, you know, of like, really expectation because I think there's um, a lot of operators, ourselves included, I think are trying to figure out what that looks like in the future, 
Like, is it necessary in its current format? Because it can be very expensive and burdensome uh, f- for operators to really have to do the things that are in the spirit of compliance, which we're, we're fully behind. But could it be done a different way, quicker, better, faster, without all the considerations that we have to go through today that may be uh, just a little much in layman's terms, right? So I think for us, having a really good understanding of our obligations to those systems and to those rules allows us to then build tools, systems, people, processes around it so we can be slick, reduce operational costs, increase efficiencies, right? And I think that's really where we have some special sauce in, in that area in particular. Yeah, and the, the track and trace can be really burdensome, right? I know a lot of companies have kind of, uh, it's been kind of a, a sore, in, sore in their their business plan, right? It takes a lot of man hours, a lot of time. Um, there is a silver lining though, right? Like there's this macro concept behind it that if you can keep track of everything throughout every process in the supply chain, you should be able to create correlations and do business intelligence that provide feedback to optimize your process as a whole. But currently, because these programs are maintained and implemented by the state, right? A lot of those high-end data analytic tools are not embedded into the software currently. Is that kind of the the state of the industry right now within these track and trace programs? They're a little like disjointed, maybe yeah. in, a, in a in a more friendly term, if you will, where like you need to do some extra steps in, of integration and really like learning and and stepping through all the pieces to make sure you could use, for example, a basic Tableau environment that people could trust or, excuse me, integrate a, a data lake like a snowflake and put that uh, in interfacing with your seed to sale system. So there's a lot of like, call it traditional tech things you, that you do. It may take two, three, four or five more steps um, while doing them as a cannabis business. And a lot of what I think our peers and us go through as public companies that are increasingly going through more financial regulations, you also have to have super robust controls in those systems. So from a financial audit standpoint, our rules and regulations and obligations are crazy, right? And they increase every single day. And that detracts from, you know, building features that are great for customers or or other more competitive things, right? So I think that's really uh, an unspoken, but definitely a a big piece of the consideration for the larger companies in the space. They have to build a lot of compliance-driven controls and features to really meet regulations. And, And ultimately, that takes time. So for us, the integration piece and the ability to do BI and analytics really comes with the interface with these systems. And our ability to uh, really do do that extends to our people, right? We have an internal team, I think six, seven folks that really focus on data pipelines first analysis and uh, call it uh, prediction and modeling second. And that's a really, I think, a a key competency that we have as well. Uh, Extending from our systems is the people that actually do the work are, are really talented as well. So let's take a step back, right? Because I want to make sure everyone understands. Business like Cresco, vertically integrated, running maybe six businesses simultaneously in a single state. They're doing cultivation. They're doing processing. They're doing retail. When you're spinning up these businesses, they have their own tools. Then you have to figure out how to get them connected so they communicate to each other so you can pass information back. Is it more need-based or pain-based when that first kind of gets started? Take us behind the scenes kind of like, what is the conversation with Charlie at when you're when you're scheming on saying, hey, like, Right now, we want to get A to talk to B so we can figure out this. Or is it another version where we're not thinking about and say, hey, this would really, really would alleviate this problem? Yeah, I think it really starts with some sort of business problem and working backward, backwards from that. So like taking some cultivation technology, for example, into consideration. Our, our folks who run cultivation are really technology driven. They're, they're as much into tech as they are into plants and come up with really crazy awesome ideas for us then then to have to fulfill and so ultimately that means like engaging with vendors like trim is a vendor that you guys may have heard of that has a sensor uh, that we have in some of our facilities that allows us to capture environmental data and all sorts of other data at a frequency that allows us to really dial in plant conditions to drive yields right at that point it's really important to just make sure we just know the 
you know, how is this ultimately going to scale, right? Like you said, six states, does this have an ROI on it? What, what is the schedule? And ultimately like what value does it drive for customers? Cause at the end of the day, like the product's going to the customer, right? Does it make it better for the customer? I think is a big question we often ask internally that helps drive product quality, but a cult at a cultivation example, that allows us to tie some change we made there to the end product and say, Hey, did it, did it really work? And then otherwise it's kind of as a needs basis. You know, I think sometimes we'll encounter a problem, maybe let's say in distribution where um, now we have so many trucks on the road every time we're late, right. Or every time we take a wrong route, it might cost us far more money than it used. to. So investing in technology that allows us to, you know, maybe be more UPS like or, or similar to, to kind of simplify it is really a good and interesting idea to us now that maybe like three, four years ago wasn't even in the, the possibilities, right? That's not something we cared about at that point. Um, and it's also like where we can um, create differentiation because I think um, something interesting about what we do internally that may be unique is we build a lot. A lot of folks. Um, and this isn't a critique, it's just a, an observation, use stuff that's off shelf. Uh, they may use um, a point of sale, like a trees or a duchy or what have you, or an e-com system like a chain or a dispense or what have you. We've built a lot of those parts of the stack ourselves because we feel that um, it can offer us actually competitive differentiation. And when you look at a lot of the head-to-head -head competitive metrics that we measure to make sure that's true. We, we believe it's panning out. So for us, it's really about identifying the problem and working backwards. Like, is it a big enough problem to solve with technology? And then kind of develop a thesis from there and, and, and ultimately solve it with a, a technology product or working with a vendor externally. Is there like a critical point where you guys are like out looking for a technology solution you may find one off the shelf and you're like hey this just doesn't do xyz and now this is why we're going to build it like talk us through like how you make the decision to buy versus build internally sure i think it really starts with sourcing first right are we lean towards buy if we can it's generally cheaper <laughs> right. and easier to maintain <laughs> and quicker to start right it also has a commodity cost to it where if everybody is doing it and it's already in the market freely available you you may be silly not to right you may it may cost you more not making that decision and if we go through that process and find that it's not or we're not happy with the quality right like there may be three options but it's not doing what we need it to do at that point we evaluate building and i think What's interesting, um, and this is a concept I've seen a couple of people on Twitter talk about, but like compounding product interest over time, you know, you've built this ERP like system. You may evaluate building some today that four years ago you wouldn't have built, but because you're so far along, building it now is much cheaper, much easier. And you're actually kind of doing yourself a service by adding IP value to that to, to really grow it's full capabilities, which is like kind of cannabis 3.0, right? Not your capacity and your assets, but your capabilities. So that's kind of where we're at now. We didn't just start building this thing. We've been building this thing for going on eight years now. So we have a more robust ecosystem where our buy build evaluation may skew a little towards build sometimes because of how big that system has become albeit not with its own challenges and maintenance and, and, and otherwise but does it make it easier to integrate right because you guys probably you've built the pipelines so like you're like we know what both fits right here right like so integration becomes easier correlation between different departments all that faster right no doubt and really traditional master data management becomes yeah. cohesive and manageable at scale and when you buy or acquire companies like we do or the pets we do when you bring somebody along like our last acquisition was a small retailer in pennsylvania a market where we already operate it's really easy to say hey two new stores welcome to the family you now use these buttons click the buttons in this system and it will drive this outcome don't push those buttons and it adds a better employee experience 
it produces an outcome that we know what to expect. And ultimately, like you said, it goes to the same pipelines, right? We're not creating a lot of new stuff or having to rely upon a, a vendor of sorts to kind of deliver us what we want in those instances versus getting exactly what we want. And it's just easier and quicker to do that now. The bigger you get, the riskier it becomes as well, right? Like ultimately, I'm the tech guy that people call or my folks when something breaks, right? Most of the time, not somebody externally. So there's a, a great responsibility to make sure that it it performs at a high clip. Otherwise, you know, it, it doesn't go very well for us. So we can get into all the fun aspects, but we got to stay with some of the challenges because I don't think people realize how hard that actually is to start, right? You you have an idea, you have a concept, whatever that first one was, maybe you can share it with us building that source. Then you have to hire a software developer. You got to figure out how to get started. You got to figure out what programming language you want to do. You want to figure out where you want to host it. And then you got to take us through that process of like your team still handling everything that Cresco does, but internally you're like, okay, we're going to try to build this software program that may or may not work. And that's not an easy risk for a cannabis company to take. There's not endless cash. You're not a, a Silicon Valley startup that's got a team of developers. So like, what was that first product that was put together internally? And what was the USP that you were trying to look that you thought, okay, if we can achieve this, then we can, we can do next. Awesome question. Right before Cresco, um, in gen one of cannabis, my partner who runs software engineering today at Cresco and I built like the first Jane, if you will. We scaled it to about 200 locations. And at the time, the biggest locations in the country used it. And we sold it to a, a micro cap company right at the beginning of cannabis. And we had built this thing before, kind of. And we knew what that data model looked like and how businesses really looked at their selling online and their actual traceability data. We, and we thought we knew what the future was gonna look like. So we started building it early on at Cresco and we built it piece by piece with a really small team. Like you said, we don't have a large engineering team. We have a really small team of 10 Xers. That's what we have. And uh, you have to create a development culture, which is really important that really endorses and um, rewards excellence, right? And um, I think that's what we've been able to build. And over the last two years, we also added a product capability to it because engineers by themselves um, can, be, can be dangerously good and dangerously idle if they don't know what to build. And our product team really leveled us up and making sure exactly what we're building is at the right time, at the right pace, and is the exact feature that will do the thing the business wants, like 2AT. And so for us, adding that layer of product professionals has allowed us to just make a better product and, and not have something that's anything less than exactly what we want. And from a, like, exactly what code you use or what libraries or technologies I think that's an ongoing evaluation and preference of largely our, our distinguished engineers, our lead engineers who lean towards, in our case, being a node in, in, in Java shop, a JavaScript shop. But in, in any event, we participate across the board and just kind of evaluate that on a, on a case by case basis. And I think we use a lot of the technologies that a lot of people use, AWS and otherwise, that aren't proprietary. It's really what you build, right? And I think uh, going back to that compounding product interest concept, that's really where we're at now. If we had this conversation maybe four years ago, when COVID started, it was like, oh my God, we're launching the e-com. We don't know if it's going to be amazing. And we're kind of we're stressed out, you know, it was a different story, but now we're on the other side of that where it did work and 80 plus percent of our customers on Sunnyside, right, are through our website. So that's really driven again to your question, like by the team, right? The team really has, I think, a lot of interest in the product because of their longevity with the code base. And um, we're able to have that interest I speak of as a result. So a lot of that impact is sort of like your KPIs within that success rate is measured on like downstream impact, right? In terms of increasing sales and all that, similar to like how Amazon handles a lot of their their products that they launch that don't instantly increase revenue. You you handle a lot of your guys' tech stack and, and tech projects that you embark on. 
with like similar KPIs in order to reward those those members of your team, correct? Absolutely. And even giving credit to a large part of our effort that's not as like sexy and cool from a building perspective, but absolutely necessary for us to like operate as a functioning corporate entity, right? We we do the non-sexy stuff too, right? We just implemented a huge procurement system that allows us to buy things the best, most compliant, cash controlled way versus having a, a less controlled purchasing environment, if you will. So there's the traditional corp operation stuff that we ultimately have to participate in and be excellent at as well if we want the balance sheet that we desire, right? So that that type of stuff for us is is at least half the effort as well. The stuff that every company needs to do, right? And you're kind of just the block, I'll refer to it as blocking and tackling, but really important, maybe Super Bowl blocking and tackling where you you need to be at a high level. So that is also, I think, a big part of what our org or larger cannabis orgs have to do that uh, smaller ones uh, just aren't, aren't required to do. I would imagine that after you've achieved that first real success internally, people start saying, hey, like you got that problem. Zach can build you a tool for that. Zach and his team can build that. So take us through, is that across the entire operations? Is there certain focus? Like, is it just retail? Is it just cultivation? Just processing? Where are those tools? Are they all interconnected? Take us through kind of the whole inner workings. Sure. On the wholesale side, I'll just talk in maybe percentages to keep it light. We probably do 50% of the business and the other 50% we elected to go with the vendor um, very strategically. And that's Canex. I I don't mind naming them by name. It's a a cannabis system in the uh, in the space. Uh, they're fantastic. They're they they're a really development driven company in our view, and they're they're a bunch of engineers who have built a really good product that does what we need it to do, and then some. So we have a call it fifty percent approach on our wholesale business, where we interface with the Canex system to do a lot of clever stuff that allows us to do what we need to do on the wholesale side. On retail, excuse me. Um, we largely, uh, let's say we we cover 90% of the base and uh, the other 10% is Dutchy for us right now. And um, to that end, we have aspirations and goals of really uh, merging those, that, that system on our side is one system and we continue to make it closer and closer together. So it's really a full scale ERP. That's our uh, intention and, and goal. And on the corp side, we have a lot of systems, just like any real corporation, right? Our marketing team uses oodles of things, right? We have a, a really, um, call it sophisticated customer growth engine where people text, email, uh, do everything related to marketing to bring customers into the store. And then on our, our legal side, even recently, we got some really slick technology that allows us to do really awesome stuff as it pertains to applications and otherwise. So we have, I would say, at my last glance, about 75 SaaS systems that we interface with in total, some more material than others. But ultimately, the the uh, sentiment that you just said, right? Like, hey, Zach's team can build this, is like one we take really seriously, right? Like, that's an awesome place to be. Like, if people think that we can build them something that's really useful, uh, that that means our 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 team, our skills are in high demand. And I believe that is the uh, current and has has been the 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 kind of sentiment around here. And for us, it's just about uh, prioritizing. That's always the challenge as a technology company or as a technology department in a company that's not a technology company, like you referenced earlier. You got to prioritize. Like that list is long, and so. Make sure you do it in the order, you know, the business desires. And I think therein lies kind of some of the uh, the art and science that we go through daily. 100%. And the reason I wanted to bring that up is because I think there's a ton of tools that everyone's super familiar with on the retail side. But I think the internal operations, the cultivation and the processing side is part of the growth of the industry where the more tools that are adapted there kind of can lean into a more efficient operation where people can really hone in on some of those margins and drive better decisions. If you're doing cultivation and manufacturing, you know, you connect those two systems, you get a better visibility into how strains are yielding and then how they're going through the processing. So are there tools there that your team has built in order to give you a, a leg up on the comp- competition? We have, and it's really largely driven by the ops team's desire to know that stuff, right? Like we are not involved in the business 
uh, acumen that they have, you know, or the de decisions that they have to make. So ultimately, we have a couple really slick folks over there who are actually very technically inclined that say, hey, I want to know, like you just described, or very similar to understand either performance across variants, across sizes, across strains, and like have across everything, right? And the the assumption being we drive positivity on the next inputs and outputs that are, are going through the model. And yeah, we have um, awesome, let's call it for lack of better terms, trackers and measurements and capabilities, excuse me, in that arena. And ultimately um, that drives product innovation for us. And so I like to think that we have some pretty great products and, and lead and uh, share in a lot of the markets that we're in. And I think ultimately that's driven by folks on our side, like there's a real desire to make great products, one, but two, they're really slick, right? They use technology to their advantage across the chain, including manufacturing. I'm so glad Brian asked that question. This morning, I was actually uh, thinking about the conversation we're going to have today, and I was uh, going to get a cup of coffee, right? At Starbucks, and I used the app, right? And, you know, I was like, cool convenience. And then I thought a lot about like your guys' Sunnyside store and how you're kind of trying to turn it into like, more of a fulfillment center in essence, right? And so I was thinking, I was like, there has to be when I order that cup of coffee on the Starbucks app, that then it's updating inventory within their ERP that's then helping them manage their entire supply chain of coffee beans, right? They have a set number, they know how much this coffee makes this much, right? And so I was thinking, I was like, I wonder if that's exactly where Cresco's going with their ERP and integrating it within the retail back all the way to cultivation? If so, is that like, is there value in that real-time information that you're seeing from a sales perspective at the retail location for the cultivation team and the manufacturing team? And if so, like, what are some of those value adds that you get from monitoring that real-time data? At the end of the day, right? You're really just managing cost yep. revenue, right? And that's like, ultimately what you want to do really well as quickly as you possibly can so you never have more on hand than you need or less on hand than you need and do it at a an operating margin that you desire and for us connecting those data streams as closely to human as closely together as humanly possible allows us to just know what we didn't know previously and in traditional systems at the call sap or oracle or otherwise that's what they do. They really allow you to dial that in to your example. This used, this amount of beans, this lid, this thing, this thing, and then it, it calculates run rates against your latest estimate, and it knows what you have on hand and can execute POs and do all the things that you really need to do to operate with certain EBITDA expectations and certain operating margin expectations. And so for us, that's what we're trying to get to in cannabis, because the the ultimate data obligation is that seed to sale, it's really making sure you can meld those worlds closely. And for us, we do it a certain way. I know some of our competitors do it a different way. That's also, I think, not the same as us, but it's very intelligent and smart. And I think they're getting to the same place. And there's some people who don't do it at all. They don't feel it's necessary for their scale. So I think like in cannabis, ultimately, our expectation is to get to excuse me, a very traditional ERP-like life cycle where you purchase very intentionally with full-scale controls and understanding of the turn and, and, and quality of that inventory and bring it back in full cycle so the next time you make that decision, you're doing so with even more intelligence, right? And we're not there yet. I don't want to give any illusions there, but that's, that's the goal, right? Like that is absolutely what we're striving towards. And um, I think we'll still have to tap in some outside vendors to ultimately complete the mission, but that is that's absolutely the uh, the mission and the obligation. Yeah, I mean, Kellen made it seem so effortlessly because it's Starbucks, but it, <laughs> internally, like <laughs> there needs to be excessive tools internally, right? Like the software can only work if there's tools communicating to it, and then you need to connect everything together. And some of these tools are rarely, not as commonly found in cannabis as they are in oil and gas and food and bed. So I'm assuming there's probably those tools you, you brought over in order to understand the same details and levels of information that all the other manufacturers are using or all the other cultivators are using so that you can make those improved decision makings. I want to highlight the online versus in-store 
Did did I read that correctly? Eighty five percent of your retail stores are online purchases. I believe in our last investor presentation, it's eighty plus, eighty to eighty five, and it depends on the market. And that's really, um, you know, ultimately driven. In, in my view, by we really started in COVID as a retailer, right? Like that's when Sunnyside and our key markets moved from medical to adult use. You see the step function drives in revenue and we opened up several stores, right? And then um, for us, that's just really continued because of our investment into Sunnyside.shop. I think we set the tone and the precedent that throwing up a website with an iframe wasn't going to do it, right? Like that's not enough. You need to develop and to deliver a better customer experience because people buy so many things online now that if you analog an experience to a big retailer or a an upstart D2C company, that's a quality difference of significant proportions, you're going to struggle. And, and ultimately what we see is if you really think about a consumer process or a process of purchasing, most of it's online, right? Like you're on the website, you're looking at the thing, you may go to Leafly, you may go to somewhere else, you may go back to Google, you know, you bounce around, then ultimately you make a purchase. When you're in the store, it's a very short period of time. And obviously it should be great. And our staff does wonderful things at education, upselling and all sorts of awesome stuff within the store. The stores are beautiful. But ultimately, if you just look at the time spent, a lot of it's, the majority of it's online. So if that's not great at conversion, you got an issue. And ultimately, we knew that early on and we, we ultimately invested and kind of doubled down when, when COVID came. And the, that allowed us to develop an operational back end as well, where we're really proud of and confident in our, our ability to fulfill, for lack of better terms, the, the orders that come online. So folks don't have to wait eons within the store to, to ultimately get their products, right? Our, our ultimate goal is to get people in and out so they can do the thing. So that's why we really, I think, see that amount of percent, right? And our, it's largely due to some, you know, behavioral and larger macro shifts. And ultimately the staff, I don't know if you've been into a sunny side and adult use market, the staff is, it's impressive. It's a machine, you know, that they are really, I think, engaged and a able to make it work as we intend. And that's really what drives the numbers. So for future consumers going forward, right? They like, I know like the alcohol industry and cannabis is really similar that like the majority of purchases are from chronic users, right? Like people who use every single day, right? And so a lot of the experiences that are being cultivated within these retail locations are like educational driven and kind of first time users. So like, Looking it through like the crystal ball, do you think in the future that like most stores will just be kind of fulfillment centers because the majority of chronic users kind of know what they want. They're not looking to kind of go in and have a conversation. It's almost like an errand at that point, right? So like from a future perspective, that's probably where the majority of retail transactions are going to occur, right? I think there's a really interesting geographical dependency, right? Where you talk about as long as states are still fragmented and not legal and legal, you know, and our neighbors, border stores are going to really matter. Uh, we have border stores. Some of our competitors have some what we refer to as border stores. Those stores go. Those stores are really big and those stores perform at a high level and ultimately um, have a lot to do with their geographical, you know, location. So, those withstanding, right? I think a lot of the foot traffic happens when you're in a high density area, right? But even then, I think a lot of folks tend to just behaviorally prefer online because of a myriad of reasons, right? So for us, I think our goal is always to do both uh, to the best we possibly can. And if you if you went to the closest store to our HQ is River North, you'd see a very non-cannabis-like experience where you are, I think you almost feel like you're in an apparel shop and accessories galore and it's free flowing. You don't kind of have, to, there's no waiting room. There's none of that. It's bright. Uh, you're not forced to go in any direction per se. And if you walked in off the street, like you would feel like, oh, I can still be served. I can still be helped. I can still accomplish what I was going to accomplish. What's interesting and like 
you know, distinct between non-cannabis and cannabis businesses. You can't really see the product though, still in some states, you know, like it's very strange. Like when you walk into Walgreens or wherever, like you see, you know, it's Red Bull or right, whatever you're, you know, you're going to purchase. I think that piece may, hopefully may change over time but that would allow maybe a different interaction and a different normalization, right? With the product and shopping patterns of folks. And right now, because you can't see the product as well, why do you need to really go in, right? There's a bunch of like psychology involved with some of the compliance rules that drive some of that, I believe. So ultimately, mark to market border stores with standing. I think all those conditions end up in folks wanting to lean towards online more often than not. I have to ask AI tools, obviously with the rise of ChatGPT, is your team bringing AI in house? Are you found a segment internally that you think it's most adaptable and one that you're most excited about you can share with us? Sure. I think the, um, for us long-term, we think AI will definitely be a part of our stack. I know today, some of the ways that we most commonly use it, it's like, a, there's many co-pilot programming tools that our team engages with that ultimately just speed up their workflows. And on our finance side, we have a bunch of existing tools that are ultimately like enriched with AI, right? Like a lot of people or existing platforms are adding AI to their platform versus us going adopting a whole new platform. We use the same platform with AI capabilities, if you will. And um, to that end, that allows us to do things like process invoices faster, right? When you're a really big company, you have oodles of invoices, you have oodles of POs, right? And it becomes a a a big job to manage that pile. So we've seen a lot of cost reduction and efficiency improvements and like call it document processing across the board. Anytime you can say standard expectation, put the thing together, process the thing, it's kind of easy, right? Or it's it's a low hanging fruit. And so for us, that has been, you know, some of the things we've just tried to focus on first. I see future use cases really being Intel driven, so to that end, you could argue, why does a customer need to build a cart, right? Like, do you know what they want? Probably. Could you maybe have that cart be best optimized to your inventory position and their preference at the same time, right? Or do you know that they shop on certain days? And so you can make sure when your messaging or your pricing strategy is best suited for people who have the highest price elasticity, right? So like, there's a lots of different ways, I think in the future, AI will just make those decisions faster. That's the big thing where right now, that would be hard to do, I think, arguably with some of the LLMs that exist and some of the just mechanical pieces, but we're really excited. Like the tools that are coming out are are nothing short of amazing, right? They do fascinating stuff. And I know our, our marketing folks use them as well for generative content purposes, but we're still probably, I'd say like inning one and a half, like too early to tell, but very excited. The reason I ask is because like your team seems to have the propensity to take on these newer technologies and experiments where I think a lot of other companies may be a little more hesitant because you need to have the right mindset and the right culture. You know, I could see it one being where the, you had a really big growth for a new plan and think this strain could yield really well. And because of that, it triggers out and say, hey, maybe we should change some operational plans and and start growing this in the future because this could be a really good deal. Those are the type of insights that I think are are a little more forward thinking that take a little more of a riskier approach of saying, like, we're going to try to build a tool to achieve certain information so we can hit certain efficiencies, which I know your team is really focused on right now and and going forward. Yeah, I'm really excited, too, about the when AI gets eyes, right, which just happened recently and integrating it into camera systems. I've seen a lot of cool stuff both on the security side that could just reduce cost, increase visibility. And you can imagine what it could do to plants, right? If it had eyes and it could see everything all the time and you engineered it to look at something or for something, you could do a lot of interesting stuff. So I think cameras is really, really interesting for us. Like, and and I think all of cannabis right now, because those folks are innovating so quickly uh, with AI that I think we can use our existing infrastructure. So no CapEx really, right? It's really like some some OpEx into software and ultimately just get our capabilities, you know, to have a step function. There's that company that 
a couple of years ago was integrating uh, cameras into, again, maybe analyzing haploid or, or something specific within plants. Um, I think they're a purchase though, but it's definitely being applied to the industry right now in terms of utilizing optic image to evaluate plant health and nutrient and all those things. And like, imagine like integrating IR cameras as well and, and all of that simultaneously and, and, and then chat and then the AI controls your HVAC, right? Like it'll be a lights out. No doubt. AI for, you know, everything, if you will, at some point and like cautiously optimistic right now, because it's not, it's stodgy, right? It's mostly as you interfaces that you chat with, there is, folks doing amazing things and the capabilities I think are going to be big, but for us, like it's prioritization ultimately. Like if, if we could, like we would build a lot with it, but right now we're still trying to figure out like what it really is for us. You know, is there a particular issue or an aspect that your team is struggling with that you would say, Hey, if there's an entrepreneur building this product or this solution, it would make a big difference for us. Good question. Hmm. I think right now, a couple people in the space are really attempting to build, let's call it skew. In the non-cannabis world, when you go buy stuff at a grocery store, everything has a barcode on it and has an, an SKU. In cannabis, there's real no, there's really no subscribe to or required skew. So we each have like our own identification system of products. And so you get really fragmented data. So all the data and analysis providers in our industry, right? You have everything from hoodie or Jane's catalog or like a headset or a BDSA. These folks who provide great big macro capabilities to operators like us, there's no skew. Like, I don't know where to go to say, hey, that's this exact product by identified by these standards that has these metrics associated with it. So data is tough. Right. It's all kind of call it messy as a result. So I know a couple of people are really working on like as, as simple as it may sound, a skew system, if you will. I'd put lucid green in that bucket as well. They have a really interesting system. So if you could solve that, that would that would help everybody and I think would support everybody. And as well, just really refining the customer experience, messaging customers or Acquiring customers is always a good place to play. There's a couple really interesting uh, disadvantages that cannabis companies have. It's really hard for us to text people, right? So a couple of companies have come up with clever ways to stick a wallet in somebody's phone. That way you can send them push notifications as opposed to text. So things like that, that allow you to reach the customer compliantly, that allow us to develop new customers are it's a really big area that's underserved right now in cannabis just because we can't participate in facebook ads and things like that so we all want new customers right in the door so driving ways to do that is is really important for us and is really underserved what is the most expensive lesson you've ever learned oh luckily we avoided one with the crowd strike we are not a crowd strike customer so that did not make the list i guess long ago in my first company, it was called uh, Topple Track. We actually did copyright protection, protection and management. We worked with several thousand record labels and we were kind of like Google janitors. Every time the piracy result showed up, we would file these large claims of legal notices and get them removed at scale. In any event, in the real early days, we, we legitimately we're like going through that physical on to cloud transition and had a big business meeting the next day for what became our biggest integrator. And I think a comma, or I forget exactly what it was, the most trivial programming circumstances ended up in like a full on reset effectively and start from scratch as a result because we were really kind of flying by the seat of our pants anyway. And so that demo didn't go as well as I really planned and ultimately may have set us back a couple months ultimately. So it wasn't that big of a deal, but I still remember like the looks on folks' faces. It wasn't, wasn't what I intended. So yeah, that was quite the learning lesson and being prepared and, not, and, you know, knock on wood, not much sense, you know? What question do you wish more people asked you? At Cresco or in cannabis, maybe like 
what do you think's next? So we considered it earlier in the game, right? I think technology in many instances, not just in cannabis or not just here at Cresco, is often just brought along for the ride instead of being at the front of the consideration when you're not a technology company. And it's like, oh, tech will just solve it. It'll just work. You know, you just put things together and it just works. Sometimes that's not the case, right? So just really, uh, hey, what do you think about this uh, as early as possible, I think, really would serve your organization well, regardless of who you were. Most of the time, it doesn't work right away. And second, <laughs> guessing is a terrible way of making really informed decisions. Yeah, agreed. So prediction time. Zach, what percentage of cannabis companies do you think will follow Cresco and start integrating in proprietary software stacks? And what is the biggest benefit that most people don't recognize? I think a lot of our peer set is right now to some degree. Um, so I think if you think about maybe just the, the retail side, I think at some point you may see over 50% of the market have some sort of custom-ish shopping interface. That's not the uh, uh, maybe boilerplate approach of today. And I think in cannabis, which in, what's really interesting that's um, unique is we're not as uh, impacted by the marketplace syndrome like food is, for example. Most customers don't go to any of the marketplaces, and I won't name them by name, to go order. They go to the dispensary directly because that's where the most benefit is, right? That's where the loyalty program is. That's where the discounts are. There's no real benefit, and there's some cannibalization with traditional services like Google Maps and Yelps, et cetera. So for us, I think in our industry, investing in a custom environment on the retail side is more common because of that. And then on the wholesale, call it manufacturing production side, I think it's probably going to be a lot less likely. Um, just like we partner with folks to get the whole job done, I think the Canxes, the Flourishes, the the folks that participate in that area, the supply chain, will have, I think, predominant market share because it's it's such a challenging product. Kellen, you take a swing. Yeah, uh, I agree with Zach on the retail front. I think though that the kind of infrastructure side of the of things is going to kind of follow maybe more of like an automotive approach, right? Where like you look at like Tesla, right? They make a lot of the drive trains for a lot of the electric cars, right? And so like I could see like specific companies like Cresco potentially coming out with like an ERP system that just works so well that they're just going to take it and then diversify revenue and sell it to all the other big MSOs as well while maintaining their own proprietary solution, right? So like, I think that you'll see something like that happen on, on like the back end of things with like ERP and like some of the more complex software solutions that need to be developed for managing these businesses. But on the front end, I think that it's a no brainer for everyone to own their own retail website and control that experience with the consumer, right? There's all those psychological things, that, those psychological games that they're playing. Uh, what do you think though, Brian? I think having the mindset and willingness to try to build tools that don't currently exist or adapt other tools, I think is a, a real separator for companies. I think since we do seed to sale, it, people don't recognize how challenging it is to have six of those businesses all wrapped in one, having to communicate. And that's only one single state, right? When you're trying to be organized and make really good decisions as a team, when you sit up top of the work chart, you need to have clear data sets that gives you information so you can have actionable insights into it. And I think the more we look into efficiencies and being lean operations, I think you start narrowing down on key KPIs and cultivation and processing. And then I think it helps solidify margins all the way through retail. And I, I think what your team's doing, Zach, is awesome. And it's it's really fun to dive into the nuanced details because I can only imagine some of the requests that people come to you and say, hey, Zach, you know, like you built this, it'd be really cool to have this tool do this. And you're like, yeah, I just need six months and $5 million. <laughs> and just put it on the list. <laughs> yeah, you just it throw it in the back of the list. Cool. So Zach, for our listeners, they want to get in touch. They want to learn more. Where can they find you? Best place is probably email. Just Zach at CrescoLabs.com, Z-A-C-H. And I'd be happy to interface, chat, hack with uh, whomever. I love it. We'll link it up in the show notes. Thanks for taking the time. This was a lot of fun. Thanks, guys. Have a good one.